This video introduces the Mann-Whitney U-Test, or the Wilcoxon-Rank-Sum Test, two names for the same thing. This test is the non-parametric equivalent of the T-Test for the central tendency of two samples. So first, let's review the T-Test very briefly. Remember that the test statistic compares sort of the signal, which is the difference between sample means, to the noise, which is the pooled standard error of the samples. The t-test assumes that both samples are normally distributed. And you also learn that measures like mean and standard error, standard error are also only meaningful when the data are normal. So the t-test is not an appropriate one to use when one or both variables are non-normal, especially when they're skewed. So the Mann-Whitney U-test, or also called the Wilcoxon rank sum test, is designed to test for differences in central tendency for non-normal data. It's sometimes said to test for differences in the median, but that's not technically true. It has a null hypothesis that there is no difference in the mean rank of the two samples, and you'll see where the, the rank comes from in a minute. So even though, the data, even though the test does not require that your data are normally distributed, it does require that you have continuous data measured in predetermined groups. Because the test converts the data to ranks, as we'll see in a second, you can also use rank data if you have that. You must be working with univariate data grouped into only two samples. And your question must involve central tendency. That's the whole purpose of the test, not dispersion. I'll walk through a step-by-step -step demonstration of the procedure so you can understand what the test is doing. So it first combines the data from each sample into one group, and then converts the raw data into ranks. In that way, the smallest sample gets the rank of one, the second smallest two, and, and so forth. So next, it sums up the ranks of each of the original samples. In this example, we get four for the rank sum of sample one. It has the first and third smallest value, and 11 for the rank sum of sample two. <clears throat> Finally, it calculates the Wilcoxon statistic W for sample one. There are, are some differences um, so I've illustrated what the, the procedure that R does, but not all programs do this, this subtraction here. So for the rest of the example, we'll work only with the rank sum for sample 1, but you can try the procedure yourself with sample 2 to demonstrate that you end up getting the same p-value regardless of whether you look at sample 1 or sample 2. So remember that the p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic at least as extreme as you did observe, if the null hypothesis is true. So in our example, what is the probability of finding a rank sum at least as extreme in 4? Uh, at least as extreme as 4. So remember, we have two observations in sample 1 and three observations in sample 2. So because we have small sample size, we can calculate the p-value exactly. So let's consider all the options for rank sum in sample 1, which contains two data points. Those two observations could be the the smallest and the second smallest of the entire pool of five, giving us a rank sum of three. They could be first and third, giving us four, that's what we observed, uh, first and fourth, and, and so on. So there are, in fact, 10 different possible outcomes in our simple example shown here, um, and those are outlined and their rank sum is given beside them. So if we count up the number of possible outcomes, we can see that the probability of rank sum 3 is 1 in 10. We only got that in one of our outcomes. The probability of 4, which is our observation, is also 1 in 10. 5 is 2 in 10, and so forth. So we observed a rank sum of 4, but our p-value is not 0 0.1. Why is that? Well, we need to know the probability of a rank sum outcome at least as extreme as 4, not just 4 itself. So we have to add the probabilities of getting 3, 4, 8, and 9. So why 8 and 9 as well? That's because our alternative hypothesis is almost always looking for a difference in either direction. So the rank sum ended up being smaller, but we didn't predict that before collecting the data, so we must perform a two-tailed test. We're just looking to see if it's more extreme in either direction from the middle. Um, so that means that we have to look at 3, 4, 8, and 9, so our p-value is actually 0.4. The probability of getting a rank sum of 3, 4, 8, or 9. Each of them is 1 out of 10, so we get 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1, so our p-value is 0.4. 
Well, this ex this example had a ridiculously small sample size. It's actually impossible, as you can, if you might be able to figure out, to get a p value less than 0.2 here. Um, so, in the case of larger sample sizes or if there are many duplicate values, like ties, the p-value is actually approximated rather than being calculated exactly. So there are still some assumptions, even though it's a non-parametric test. The two samples must be independent of each other, which is typically the case unless you have repeated measurements made on the same physical objects. Um, there isn't the assumption of normality, and that's the whole point of a non-parametric test, but the two distributions should broadly have the same shape. Uh, the test doesn't work well if they're highly skewed in, in opposite directions, for example. So when reporting the results, you should give the medians of both samples. Even though the Mann-Whitney test doesn't test for differences in the median, you know that the median is the best measure of central tendency for non-normal data. You should always report the type of test that you performed. You can call it the Mann-Whitney U-test, but you may see other people calling it the Wilcoxon rank sum test. It really doesn't matter. Um, but note whether you did a one-tailed or a two-tailed test, keep in mind that two-tailed is pretty much what you'll almost always do. It is possible, however, to have an alternative hypothesis that one sample is larger than the other, but remember that that alternative hypothesis must be specified based on prior expectation rather than on the data itself. You should give the value of the W statistic. I will note that this will differ depending on which order you put the samples in. If you type in sample 1 first and then sample 2, you'll get a different W than if you have sample 2 comma sample 1. Of course, you should report the p-value. So here's an example of how you might report results for a Mann-Whitney U-test. So in R, the function is called Wilcox.test. It is still performing a Mann-Whitney U-test because they're just the two names for the same thing. So it requires two numeric vectors as the input, and these will often be the result of subset functions that you've run previously, as you've found before in this class. Uh, the output that you get back is quite brief, but it gives all the details that you need, the W statistic and the p-value, plus the alternative hypothesis that you're using um, you may receive a warning that the p-value is not exact in the case of ties. Um, but this isn't a big deal unless you probably have lots of duplicated values in your data. And it's also unavoidable. I mean, the data that you have is, is the data. You can't really do anything about what it is. Um, so you typically pretty much just have to ignore this warning if, if you get one. 